All right. Welcome back. It's our pleasure to welcome uh, Mariana Rusvig from uh, MIT, and she will be talking to us about dimers and embeddings. Okay, great. Thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation. Uh, could everyone hear me now? Please let me know if you hear me, if someone in the Zoom wave or do something. I can hear you. Okay, great. Thank you. Whatever that's worth. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about a um, new type of embeddings of the dimer graph. So uh, today we're going to deal with planar bipartite graphs only, which means that uh, the graph is planar. That means that it can be drawn on the plane without overlaps. And it is bipartite, meaning that vertices can be colored in black and white, such that every two adjacent vertices are of different colors. And uh, then a dimer configuration is a subset of edges that uh, cover every vertex exactly once. Uh, you can see here an example of such a dimer configuration shown in blue. And then the dimer model is a random dimer covering of a given graph by dimers. And our prototypical examples are the dimer model on the square lattice and on the hexagonal lattice, also known as domino tilings or lozenge tilings. If you deal with the uh, discrete domain with the tilings of the discrete domain on the dual graph. Uh, I hope it is clear from these two pictures that there is indeed a bijection between dimer configurations of hexagonal lattice and lozenge tilings on the a uh, triangle like this, which is the dual of the hexagonal. And actually, we can always think about it in such a way. So instead of dimer configurations, we can always think about domino tilings, where each domino is a union of two faces, white one and black one. And we are interested in uh, this tiling of the discrete domain on the dual graph by a generalized uh, dominance. And I will uh, switch from as one interpretation to another during the talk. Uh, most of the time we will think about uh, tilings of the domain, but sometimes we will think about dimer configurations, but they are in projection. Okay, so uh, here is our setup. Uh, let me define you the one of the main important objects in the Daimler model. So um, the height function is an integer valued function defined on the set of uh, vertices of the dual graph or faces of the initial graph. And uh, let me give you one of the ways to define the height function. So let us fix a reference configuration, reference Daimler configuration, which is shown in blue on this, uh, on this slide and consider a superposition of the fixed one with the random one. Then what we get is a set of simple loops and double edges. And about each double edge, I also will think as a tiny loop. And uh, now there is a very natural way of orienting uh, those uh, loops, which is let us just orient all uh, edges of the reference configuration from white to black and all edges of the random one from black to one. Then we get oriented loops and uh, the uh, height function is defined up to an additive constant, which can be fixed by choosing some phase and say that, okay, the height function at this phase is zero. Uh, then each time when we cross a loop, the height function change by plus or minus one, depending on the orientation of the corresponding loop. So here is an example of uh, the configuration together with the height function. Uh, note that if we know the reference configuration and uh, we know the values of the height function, then we can reconstruct our random configuration. So uh, our configurations, random configurations, are with, in bijection with this uh, random height function. Uh, so instead of dimer configurations, now I can think about a random height function, integer valued height function, which is defined on the set of dual uh, vertices. And note 
also that we can use this height function as a third coordinate, as shown here, to think about uh, surfaces in three dimensions. So just use the height function as a third coordinate, then we have something like this. And what we deal with, we deal with random surfaces in 3D. Um, Note that the height function itself depends on the choice of the reference configuration. However, the fluctuations do not depend on the uh, choice of this reference configuration. And today we're mostly interested in uh, fluctuations. So it is a very good definition for us. Okay, um, great. Uh, now uh, there is a, a conjecture about the fluctuations of the height function they conjecture to converge in the Gaussian tree field in some conformal structure. So uh, let me tell you a few words about the Kenyan Pinkoff conjecture. Uh, and uh, for a minute, let us focus on the lozenge stylings, on the uniform lozenge stylings. So all lozenge styling configurations are equally weighted. And uh, here is one configuration. Uh, and uh, note that about in the setup of lozenge stylings, we can think about uh, this random diamond configuration as a random surface in 3D, right? So this looks like some stack of cubes, which are stuck in the corner of some empty room. And instead of the lozenge styling configuration, I can think about some random surface. And this will be lozenge styling itself, and it's just a projection of the surface into the corresponding uh, plane. And here is how uh, uniform uh, random lozenge styling look like at a large scale. And you can see some different behavior close to the corners and inside the domain. So inside the domain, it is pretty chaotic. However, close to the edges, it is frozen. And this is a so-called um, limit shape phenomena of the uh, Daimler model or in this setup of the uh, lozenge stylings and also uh, I forgot to say but here there is a very natural definition of the height function on the vertices of the set of of, of, of the uh, lozenge styling configuration which is simply you can think about it as a height of the corresponding stack of cubes so for example the height function here is zero zero as well and then we start climbing up it is one two everywhere here it is two and so on and uh, this definition is uh, a linear modification of the definition which I gave you before. So I can, I can think about uh, the height function in this concrete setup as just the height of the corresponding stack of cubes. And uh, then this surface, this random surface can be seen as a random height function, which I was talking before, right? So, uh, and um, the limit shape phenomena is that the, uh, random height function, or in this setup, this random surface uh, will uh, will be um, concentrated around some deterministic uh, surface. Uh, more precisely, it will be uh, around some uh, minimal surface, uh, some surface which minimizing a certain surface tension with a prescribed boundary conditions, where in our case, the boundary conditions is just you know, uh, the border of this empty room. So this is the hexagon in 3D, which is not a hexagon in 2D. And uh, the picture which you can see here, this is this one, but rotated such that we indeed can see this surface, not just a projection of it to the, uh, to the plane. Uh, and uh, then, okay, if we know that the height function or this random surface concentrate around some minimal surface, the next interest is how much it fluctuates around this uh, random surface, or in other words, what's going on with the fluctuations of the height function. Note that close to the corners, there is no fluctuations. It's just completely frozen. So it is known. So we're not interested in fluctuations inside the corners. Uh, what we're interested in, we're interested in the fluctuations inside a so-called liquid region where we have this chaotic behavior. And um, what is known here that uh, the fluctuations inside this uh, liquid region uh, of the height function converge to the Gaussian tree field in some new conformal structure. So what do I mean by, by these words? First of all, what is the Gaussian tree field? Uh, if you never heard about it, just 
before, just think about it as a two-dimensional uh, version of the Browning bridge. Or uh, keep in mind this picture, which is a discrete Gaussian tree field with zero boundary conditions, uh, which approximates a continuous one. And uh, the Gaussian tree field is a Gaussian process with a covariance given by the Green's function. Uh, Green's function on this domain with zero Dirichlet boundary conditions. Um, note that the Gaussian tree field is not a function, it's not a random function, but a random distribution, which means that it's not really defined uh, in a point, which is kind of clear from this picture. However, if we smooth it uh, uh, through some test function, then we can indeed define a covariance, and covariance is given by the Green's function on, uh, on our domain. Uh, okay, so let us talk about fluctuations in the setup of the uniform voltage timings. And uh, it is known uh, in this concrete setup that uh, the fluctuations converge to the Gaussian tree field uh, with zero Dirichlet uh, conditions, uh, but in a new complex structure. So what does it mean? One should map this liquid region into a unit disk. Here is a map. Um, this is some concrete map. What is important about it is that it is not, not a conformal. So we change a conformal structure when we map it from here to there. So we get a new complex coordinates here. And what we get, we get the GFF from this new coordinates, new complex structure. So it's simply not the case that uh, you get the uh, Gaussian tree field in the initial coordinates if you just stay there. You need to change the conformal structure. And um, so Kenyan Kunikov conjecture uh, is, so they, 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 they just conjecture that this Gaussian tree field uh, appear universally in the Daimler model. And uh, there is a description uh, of this uh, conformal structure, conjecture description of this conformal structure, in, at least in the setup when we deal with uh, biperiodic graphs with biperiodic uh, weights. So uh, let me skip actually this slide and go there. Can I ask? Can so I ask what do I mean? Sure. Uh, so yep. maybe you could actually could go back to slides. The, 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 this, this new, this different conformal structure, what is it? I mean, okay, you gave a formula, but what is it specified by some character? Is it characterized by some kind of uniquely by some sort of property? I mean, what, what, what you know, how, how how does it appear? I mean, how you know what is it specified by that that, that the that this uh, the boundary of the liquid region should go to some something or or what is, what is its defining property? The the, the new complex structure, the, the new conformal structure. Uh, so uh, I can I can just use uh, no, like this this map is simply written here yes. so how to map the liquid region so it is a disk and we map it to a disk uh -huh. but by some map which is not a conformal map yes uh, and now uh, what you get is uh, uh, the uh, GFF in, in, in like you need to consider the oops the I mean, composition of these new coordinates together with the Gaussian tree field. This is what you get. Well, this I, is a Gaussian. Why? Why do? Sorry. Yes. I can. No, I kind of understand, so to speak, the the conjecture. It says that the GFF should appear, but in in a different conformal structure. I'm wondering whether this different conformal structure is characterized by some geometric complex analytic property of some kind or some sort. I mean, how, you know, how does it appear? I mean, you you wrote. Uh, Oh, I see. Okay, so yes. Um, so it's more like a like he, question to speak that I'm asking. Uh, uh, right here, this is some weird map, and I didn't explain how exactly we get it. But this is a concrete map for this concrete setup. When we start with the hexagon and we map it to the um, with when we deal with the uniform uh, Lorentz-Stallings on on the uh, hexagon. So here, here is the more general uh maybe more clear let, let, let me say a few words so uh kenyan Kuinkov conjecture uh, says that um there there exists a, a function function z uh, on a liquid region which satisfies the following properties here uh, i am in the setup of uh, lozenge tilings only so the, the the lattice is hexagonal lattice let us focus on it 
Uh, and in this setup of the hexagonal lattice, there exists uh, a function uh, which satisfies the following properties. First of all, it satisfies this uh, differential equation, which is a differential equation for hexagonal lattice. So if we deal with another lattice, we will have another uh, equation here. So this equation is dependent on the lattice. For different regular lattices, we will get different uh, equations here. And the second condition is that it is given in terms of the limit shape of the height function of the normalized height function uh, in the following way. So more precisely, we should think about the gradient. So we we'll look at our liquid region. Uh, we have our you know, limit shape of the height function and we consider a gradient uh, to, to our limit shape. And then this function Z is given in terms of the limit shape in the way which is, which is written here. So it is some concrete map as soon as we know two things. First, limit shape, and the second is the um, lattice which we started with. So it is given in some precise way in terms of the limit shape and the lattice. And uh, this is just a theorem that such a map exists, always which satisfies these two conditions. And the conjecture is that this is exactly the map which defines as the new conformal structure for the, for the uh, fluctuation, for the Gaussian field. Is it more, cl more clear now? Yes, thank you. Thank you, yes. Okay, great. Is there some characterization of the types of limit shapes that can show up? Uh, this is uh, another hard question, actually, because here you really no need to know this, this limit shape. Uh, however, it is known that the limit shape it is always a, a minimal uh, something which minimizes a certain entropy functional, which is known. But it is a hard question to identify it in each concrete case. It is known so far for very precise types of boundary conditions. But uh, okay, in general, we always know that this is some minimal surface, but we don't know which exactly and how to identify it, which, which we need to identify the, uh, the uh, conformal structure for Kenyan Kulikov conjecture. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I mean, like uh, I showed you the setup of the um, hexagonal lattice, and I even said to you that in the setup of some other regular lattice, so some other bipartite graph, bi-periodic bipartite graph with bi-periodic weights, uh, some another equation will appear here. Um, so uh, okay, just to uh, you know summarize. Uh, it uh, all together again. Uh, Kenyan Kunkov conformal structure is defined in terms of lattice dependent entropy functional. Uh, but imagine that we want to deal with non regular lattices only. So we want to deal with something which is not biperiodic, either just weights or both weights and the graph itself. So, how, how, how to do this then? And uh, whether it is still a GFF and what can we say and what can we do about it? Um, also repeat that what we were doing, we first go to the scaling limit, we, can, we found the limit shape, and only then we describe this conformal structure. Could I uh, define this conformal structure already on a discrete level? And this is exactly what I'm going to talk about. So let me give you, a, let me start talking about these new embeddings of the diamond graph. So here is our goal. So what we want to do is we want to draw a graph um, a dual graph in our case. Recall that the height function itself lives on the vertices of the dual graph. So that's why we want to in, uh, embed the dual graph. And now, starting from here, we're always going to think about domino tilings instead of uh, diamond configurations. So we're looking for domino tilings. And we want to grow a graph in such a way that fluctuations on these drawings converge to the Gaussian grouping. In other words, these. Um, uh, these embeddings uncode our conformal structure in some nice way. So, and uh, we claim that uh, what we call T embeddings or circle pattern embeddings are such embeddings. And uh, yet again, so I'm looking for the embeddings of the dual graph instead of the initial graph uh, in such a way that uh, these uh, geometrical embeddings define some weights, geometrical weights, and those weights. If, uh, give us the same probability measure as the initial ones. So here it is. I'm going to explain it more, more, more clear in a, in a couple of minutes. Can I ask and here, uh, sure. Uh, 
sorry, all of the, we're talking about now weighted graphs, but there were, uh, maybe I missed something, but earlier when you were talking about dimer models, there, there didn't appear to be any weights, or maybe there were, yes, but they were. Uh, right, I, I, I didn't give a definition yet. I'm going to give it in, the, in, in just in two slides. Uh -huh. So yeah, now we're going to deal with the weighted graphs. Um, so yeah, okay. it's, it's, it's coming. Uh, sorry for that. I should have done it earlier, indeed. Um, anyway, so uh, here are two uh, main results. So uh, as I said, like we found some nice embeddings, uh, which should describe a conformal structure. Then the reasonable question whether those embeddings always exist and whether uh, they indeed define a correct conformal structure. So here are some results confirming. Uh, at least partially, these uh, uh, goals. So first of all, we showed that uh, those embeddings exist at least in the following cases. So when we deal with the uh, finite graphs with the outer face of degree four, which is not very good if you think about uh, approximations and scaling limits, because if I want to approximate some domains, then definitely the outer face should have a larger degree. However, uh, this is still an open question to, to uh, show it in the uh, whole generality, but at least something we can show. And for any biperiodic graphs with biperiodic weights, uh, such embeddings always exist. And then uh, the second result on this on, on this slide uh, is about uh, uh, scaling limit uh, of the fluctuations. So assume that uh, we have a sequence of perfectly embedded uh, graphs. I'm going to explain all definitions. What does it mean perfect and what is the embedding? Don't worry. Um, so, but then under some technical assumptions um, and um, on, 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 on phases of the embeddings together uh, with the fact that those embeddings converge to a Lorentz minimal surface, we can show that uh, in this setup, fluctuations converge to the Gaussian tree field in the conformal structure of this Lorentz minimal surface. So the goal for the rest of the talk is to, uh, you know, give all definitions and uh, explain statements of these theorems. Sorry. I guess it's from. Yeah. Um, okay. So. Um, uh, now, uh, as as uh, as I promise, let me let me define a finally define a probability measure on dynamic configurations. So let us fix some weight function on the set of edges. So we assign a real number to each edge, and then the probability the dimer measure is a probability measure on dimer covers, where each dimer configuration is proportional to the product of the corresponding weights. Uh, normalized by a partition function. Uh, note that uh, if we multiply all weights by the same constant around one vertex, then the probability measure doesn't change. Why this is so? Because note that each diamond configuration contains exactly one of those edges, right? Because this vertex should be covered in exactly once. Therefore, therefore, all weights uh, of configurations will be multiplied by this constant. And uh, this probability doesn't change. So we uh, say that two weight functions are gauge equivalent if one can be obtained from another by a sequence of such multiplications. And uh, these two weight functions would define the same probability measure. So, uh, Recall that we deal with the bipartite graph, so uh, I can even reformulate it that we say that two weight functions are gauge equivalent if there exist two functions, one defined on black vertices and another on white, ver white vertices. Uh, and then uh, each weight of the first weight function can be written as a product of these two functions and the weight of the second weight function. And um, Yet again, note that the gauge equivalent weights define the same probability measure on dimer configurations. So uh, we have a sequence of gauge equivalent weights which define the same um, probability measure. So um, now let me give you one more definition important for us today, the Kestlin matrix. 
uh, first of all, what is a Kestlin science? Uh, Kestlin science, which are defined uh, again on the edges of the our bipartite graph, uh, those are uh, complex complex values with uh, which are uh, all have uh, absolute value one. And the condition is the following. The uh, signs defined on edges are said to be Kestlin signs if the alternating product around each simple phase, uh, know that all phases have even degrees since we deal with the bipartite graph. Uh, and then the alternating uh, product is even minus one to the K plus one if we deal with phase of degree to K. So this is a condition and uh, one can always define uh, for any planar bipartite graph, there is always a way to define uh, testing signs. Actually, there are many of them. You can start with, you know, any face on one edge, and then you can redefine uh, it everywhere else, and not uniquely, actually. Uh, let me also mention here that one can even choose just real values of testing signs. So you can just put plus and minus one such that they will satisfy this condition. So there is always a way to define a real uh, Kestlin science. And then a Kestlin matrix is a weighted science and just in symmetrics with rows indexed by white vertices and columns indexed by black vertices where each entry for two neighboring vertices uh, is uh, the product of the edge weight times the Kestlin sign. And now if two vertices uh, are not adjacent vertices, then this entry is simply equal to zero. So, and then uh, Kestlin showed that the partition function can be written as the determinant of such matrix for any choice of Kestlin signs. Um, the partition function is given by the determinant. Moreover, all local statistics uh, for the Daimler measure can be computed using the inverse Kestlin matrix. Um, okay. So uh, now uh, there is one um, important property of uh, such a Kestlin matrix is that it can be seen as a discrete Cauchy Riemann operator. And at least it is well known in the uh, case of the square lattice. Uh, so uh, here is the Kestlin weights, which were proposed by Kenyon uh, on the square lattice. And uh, the main property of those uh, uh, Kestlin science is that if we now consider the inverse Kestlin matrix, or better to say just one row of the inverse Kestlin matrix as the function defined on the set of black vertices, then it is discrete holomorphic. Why this is so? Now that the product of the inverse Kestlin matrix and Kestlin matrix itself is the identical matrix, which means that um, for it give us a relation for any four values of the inverse Kestlin matrix considered as a one point function. Um, we get this relation, which is simply can be seen as a discrete Cauchy Riemann operator, right? Uh, and it is zero almost everywhere except the at the fixed white uh, vertex. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yes. So and 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 then we can you know consider this uh, uh, inverse Kestlin matrix with a fixed second argument as a one point function, which is discrete holomorphic. Uh, or in other words, like this function is just in the kernel of the our Kestlin matrix, right? However, the Kestlin matrix with this very nice uh, uh, choice of uh, um, Kestlin matrix is, is, is indeed can be seen as discrete Cauchy Riemann uh, equation. Now, the question is how about a uh, more general setup? Like, I have some graph with again Wait, Kestlin can matrix. I, can I ask a small question? Sure. Yeah, if you go back one slide, so you have, you have four terms is equal to a delta function. So, the four terms you explained that though you would think of these as two discrete derivatives. But did you did you say how you can think of the delta sign? Because with the where the delta sign is on, it doesn't look like you know d bar is equal to zero, right? Okay. Note that what 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 is written here is that it is equal zero everywhere where v is yes. not v v v bar, right? 
Yes. So how I think about this function that it is a discrete holomorphic function with a singularity at V. So this I can think as a singularity and what point. Okay. And indeed, it is the case. In, in the limit, you will get the function which has a singularity at a fixed point. So you're thinking of this as a kind of inhomogeneous Cauchy Riemann equation, meaning the bar of something is equal to, to a right hand side, and the right hand side is this delta function, or, or no? no? No, no. I think about it as a uh, function which is discrete holomorphic everywhere except one point. Uh -huh. And at this one point, I have a singularity. So I don't have discrete homomorphicity, I have something. And this something uh, happened to be in the scaling limit, indeed, as a single singularity for the uh, homomorphic function, for the scaling limit itself. Thank okay? You. Yeah. Great. Um, okay, now, uh, what, what, uh, how to deal with this if we have you know, general graph and general weights. I can always say that I will define the function to be discrete holomorphic if it is in the kernel of the Castian matrix, right? So uh, I can just say that, okay, any function which is in the kernel of the Castian matrix is said to be discrete holomorphic. Uh, this is nice and our inverse uh, Castian matrix considered as a one point function is discrete holomorphic with a pole with a singularity at a fixed point. However, uh, the question is, does it make sense in the, lim in the limit? How this definition of discrete holomorphicity corresponds to the continuous counterparts, right? Uh, because on a discrete level, I can give any definition of, you know, approximation of Cauchy-Riemann manipulator, but maybe it doesn't make any sense in the limit. So what, uh, what is known that, you know, at least in the case of the square lattice and moreover is the radial graphs um, for the square lattice, which I just show you the radial graphs is just uh, similar to, to the previous uh, slide. And uh, so now what we want, uh, we want to deal with the Kessian matrix, which makes sense for, for the limit, which is can be at least seen as a nice discrete Cauchy manipulator. So we're looking for a gauge of our weights. Recall that our weights on edges are defined up to a gauge equivalence. So we are looking for a gauge which gives a good reasonable definition uh, of discrete Cauchy-Riemann operators as well. So this is one more thing which we're interested in. Okay, so now finally, let me give you a definition of our new embeddings. Um, Assume that we have a bipartite graph, which is uh, already can be represented as a circle pattern. So uh, each face is inscribed to a circle of some radius. And then uh, assume also that each uh, bounded face contain its uh, circumcenter. So it contains corresponding center of the circle. Then what we have, we have a reasonable embedding of the dual graph as well, right? By just taking the centers of the corresponding circles. And so what we're actually interested in, we're interested in circle pattern realizations with an embedded dual. Uh, with an embedded dual where we take uh, the embedding of the dual graph as centers of the corresponding circle pattern. Note that circle patterns themselves are not necessarily to be embedded. What do I mean by this? Let us consider this tiny part of the bipartite graph. And what you see on the left is not an embedding of the bipartite graph itself, right? Because if I look at these two edges, then they intersect here. So this is not a proper embedding. However, it is a circle pattern realization of our bipartite graph, meaning that all vertices of the same face lie on the same circle of the circle pattern. However, if I now look at the centers of corresponding circle patterns, then what we have, we have a proper embedding of the dual graph. And now I can forget about the circle pattern itself and just, you know, assign each phase of the uh, embedding of the dual graph to the corresponding vertex of the uh, initial bipartite graph. So what we're 
thinking about, we're thinking about circle pattern realizations of the bipartite graph with an embedded dual. So we're actually looking for a proper embedding of the dual graph. Okay. So uh, now in the uh, another project, we actually use a little bit different definition of the same embedding. Let me first give you another definition and then I will convince you that those two things are exactly the same. Um, so what is a T embedding? A T embedding is a proper embedding where, okay, all edges are straight segments and they don't overlap. And also uh, we want uh, to deal with uh, pictures where the dual graph is a bipartite. So we can color faces in black and white uh, in a chessboard coloring way. And the uh, last condition is a uh, angle condition, which is around these uh, each vertex. Uh, we ask that the sum of all black angles is the same as the sum of all white angles and both of them are pi. And if we deal with a picture which satisfy all these three properties, we will call it a team body. Okay, so uh, now let me convince you that team bedding of the dual graph and centers of the circle pattern is actually the same, the same thing. So uh, it's easy to prove using planar geometry. So note that let us start with the circle pattern and check that uh, centers of the circle pattern indeed satisfy this angle condition. This is the only thing which I need because two other properties are already uh, satisfied by definition that it is a proper embedding. So note that uh, the intersection points of two circles are symmetric with respect to the uh, center line, which means that these two angles are the same. Right, uh, then I just consider another pair. I, I take this circle and the next circle to get that these two angles are the same and so on. So what I get is, it is clear from this picture that the sum of white angles is the same of the sum of black. And then of course, all of them are pi because the full sum is pi. Uh, now, uh, okay, so this is, we check that circle patterns indeed satisfy this team bedding condition. Now let me tell you how to construct the circle pattern realization if we just have a team bedding. Uh, let us choose some white face of the team bedding and pick any point to say that this will be our point of a circle pattern realization for this corresponding white face. Uh, then we just reflect it with respect to the corresponding edge to get the uh, image of the neighboring uh, face. Uh, then know that I can keep going. So I will reflect it with respect to the next edge and so on. And why this, uh, this is a well-defined procedure because of the uh, angle condition again. So when, when I will again reflect it with respect to the last edge, I will go to the same point just because the sum of angles black and white are the same, okay? So, and then what I do, I will start reflecting around the next edge and so on. This is how we, uh, vertex, sorry, and uh, around edges of the next vertex and so on. This is how to get the whole circle pattern Okay. Um, so uh, these are two equivalent definitions of the same embeddings. Sometimes I will uh, be more uh, using the fact that the sum of angles is uh, the same Sometimes I will try to remember that there is some circle pattern as well. Uh, we will need it. Okay, and good. Uh, I hope these two definitions are clear and how they related to each other as well. Okay, let's, let's go back to our goals. We actually need to define some weights on those embeddings. Um, and moreover, we want to have Kestlin weights. So how to define a Kestlin weights given geometrically given our embedding. So for, for every uh, two uh, adjacent faces, uh, we define the corresponding ways, uh, weight as the uh, complex number which correspond to the, to, to the vector uh, of the uh, edge through which they are adjacent. And let's say that it is oriented in such a way that the white vertex is always on the left. Um, then uh, these, we need to check that such weights are indeed Kestlin weights, which means that 
uh, they uh, satisfy this Kessley insane condition. Recall that the Kessley insane condition was that the alternating product uh, around each phase of the uh, bipartite graph is either real negative or real positive, depending on the degree of the corresponding phase. So now that this condition is follows from the uh, angle condition, because let us consider the argument of the ratio of two such edges, of two such a question weights. So now that this ratio is nothing else as the argument of this angle, right? And then since the sum of those angles is pi, we just get that it satisfies the Kessler insane condition. So um, the, the second nice property of such a defined, geometrically defined custom weights is that the sum around each uh, phase of such, a, of such a weights is equal to zero, right? Because what I do, I just simply consider the sum of uh, vectors around some, some loop, simple loop. Of course, they are zero, and we have these two additional conditions, which those geometrical weights satisfy. Um, now recall that our goal was actually opposite. So what I did so far, I said that let us start with the team embedding, so some picture, then there is a way to define uh, a nice casting weights on it. So I can give, given a picture, I can define a diamond model on it. So, but uh, what we actually wanted to do, we wanted to start with arbitrary graph with arbitrary real weights and find an embedding of such a graph, right? Or, okay, in our case, an embedding of the dual graph, note that edges and dual edges are in bijection. Um, and we want these weights, which are geometrically defined, to be gauge equivalent to the initial weights. So that was the goal. And uh, indeed, uh, here is the result, which I showed you already. Let me remind it to you. So, uh, T embeddings uh, of the dual graph exist at least in two following cases. First of all, if we start with a uh, bipartite finite graph without a face of degree four, or it also exists for any biperiodic uh, bipartite graphs with biperiodic weights. Um, let me say a few words uh, how, how to prove uh, this first result and why actually we can deal with only outer faces of degree four, but not larger degrees. Um, so, uh, <laughs> Okay, so what we're looking for, we're looking for the embedding of the augmented dual instead of the dual graph itself. So what does it mean that it is the augmented? So um, uh, let us consider our bipartite graph and add a vertex at the infinity to our bipartite graph. And then we address and all, we connect all vertices of the outer face uh, to these uh, infinity verdicts. And what we're looking for, we're looking uh, for the embedding of this, uh, uh, of the dual graph of this graph with the uh, verdicts at the infinity. So which means that now I have the degree of the outer face number of uh, outer faces instead of just one. So this is what I mean. Okay, good. So. Um, go back to it. So uh, we are looking, uh, right, recall that two functions, two weight functions are gauge equivalent if one can be written in terms of the another by a product of two gauge functions and the initial weights. So what we're actually looking for, we're looking for some gauge functions, which will give us the uh, team embedding, which will give us these nice geometrical properties. So we're looking for functions G and F defined on black and uh, white uh, vertices, such that they satisfy the following condition. First of all, the sum around each vertex is equal to zero. Uh, recall that this simply corresponds to this condition that the sum around each face is equal to zero. This is our condition number one. And the second condition is just the boundary conditions which uh, tells us that, okay, uh, we have some uh, fixed polygon 
for where we map vertices of the outer face. And what we're looking for, we're looking for a team bedding uh, inside this polygon. So where outer faces go to the corresponding vertices of the polygon. And inside, it should be the team bedding. Um, OK. So uh, note that if we just found such a solution, it's not enough because we don't know that it is a proper embedding. So there might be some overlaps. Why this is so, note that the Kessley insane condition itself is equivalent to the angle condition modulo to pi, which means that we can get some overlaps. So what we need to check, we need to check that such a solution exists and this, this solution is indeed give us a proper embedding. So there is nothing overlap there. Uh, and uh, uh, one of the nice property which help us check that is that these embeddings, these team embeddings are preserved under elementary transformations of the bipartite graph. There are three types of elementary transformations which doesn't change the, neither the probability measure nor the partition function. And uh, our geometric embeddings behave very well under those uh, elementary transformations. So, um, for example, if you uh, change the edge by a pair of uh, double edges with the corresponding weights, it just correspond to, in this case, I use the definition of T embedding where the sum of all uh, angles around each vertex is equal to pi. Then we just need to add one new phase, right? So when this phase is given by this ratio on, on the corresponding segment. Note that a new picture is still a team bedding because around each vertex, the sum of black angles is equal to the sum of pi and both of them are pi. And we uh, didn't change uh, anything around other vertices. Uh, this elementary transformation just correspond to adding some diagonals. And more important that uh, the last one is so-called spider move uh, is also a well-behaved um, uh, local transformation for our embeddings. And here we use the so-called Mikkel theorem. Uh, so some planar geometry fact, now, let me not focus on it, but in this setup, I will, instead of uh, definition of the team embedding, I will play with the circle patterns uh, realizations. Um, okay, so, and we use this, um, this property uh, to, to show that the, uh, embedding in the setup of outer face of degree four is indeed a proper embedding using the result by Postnikov that any uh, planar bipartite graph with outer face of degree four can be simplified using this elementary transformation to a single loop. Then the only thing which we need to do is to find a corresponding uh, embedding for this simple loop. And then using elementary transformation, we can reconstruct the embedding itself. And this will be a proper embedding because under this elementary transformations, our embedding behave well. So we start with a proper embedding, we do elementary transformation, we go to the proper embedding. Um, and uh, what is the difficulty for the outer faces of larger degrees is that this is not true anymore. So it, it's not true that if you start with outer face of degree, I don't know, 50, then you can simplify it to a loop of degree 50. No, this is not the case. You will have a lot of inner vertices, which make it more, much more complicated uh, to check uh, such, a, such a property. Because for this simple graph, we just proved that there is always embedding with any weights which you can define on edges, but it's much more complicated for larger graphs. Uh, however, what we know is that for uh, outer face of degree to K, for generic uh, choice of the boundary conditions of the polygon for, for, for our outer face, uh, there exists a, a team embedding realization. So we cannot check that it is indeed a proper embedding. However, we can show that there is a solution uh, of these uh, gauge, uh, gauge functions. Uh, we also know that it is not unique uh, and what we don't know whether it is a proper embedding or there is at least one proper embedding among those embeddings. Uh, so uh, here is an open question where such a solution gives them a proper, uh, proper embedding. So uh, now um, 
How much time do I have, by the way? I would say about 10 minutes. Okay. Okay. Uh, good. So uh, now uh, I'm going to talk about origami map. And let me say a few words before I run to in, into it, that actually what we're looking for, we're looking not for embedding of the dual graph to the uh, plane, to the complex plane. Instead, what we're looking for, we're looking for the embedding of our graph into R2 plus two. So there will be two coordinates. So um, like better to say that this is T of G star and O of G star into R2 plus two. Uh, and uh, I already defined you the first coordinates, which lives in ARM. So you, this is our team bedding. And uh, the second thing, this is the second coordinate. Uh, this is a origami map, which I'm going to introduce to you right now. Um, so what is an origami map? Uh, origami map defined starting from a team bedding. So uh, how to define it? Choose a root face, fix it, and then uh, how to define the origami map of every other face. Consider a face path from our fixed uh, face to the some other face. And what we do is we reflect it along the edges of our path, along edges which we cross edges of the team bedding, which we cross along this path. So we just reflect it, then we keep reflecting. We take this triangle and reflect it with respect to this edge and so on. Reflect it again and again and again, and here we're done. So this is how to find the origami map of this triangle with a rooted phase W0. Uh, the first important thing is that it doesn't depend on the choice of the path, right? And this is important property, why this is so. This is thanks to the angle condition around this vertex, because when we start uh, reflecting it around edges along another path, then here we go back to the same triangle. And again, why this is so, this is because of the angle condition. You can easily check it. And then of course, when we, we get the same, uh, so this, this, this definition is independent on the choice of the face path. Um, in other words, uh, to get an origami map from the team embedding, one can choose a root face and fold the plane along every edge of the embedding. So for those who are in the room, you're lucky you can just see it. Um, here is an example, what's going on around one face, right? What you're doing, you're literally folding around each face. And after you fold everything, this is what you get. This is a origami map of our team embedding. Um, and uh, it is the case that around each vertex, you can literally do this, this embedding, like, you know, with a piece of paper. It is not the case for the whole plane. You will need to do some, you know, cuts, but uh, as a map from the plane to the plane, it will work well as this origami. Um, so now know that another nice way to construct the circle pattern itself, circle pattern realization is, you take this um, origami map, you choose some point, any point on the, on the uh, plane of the origami map and you pierce it, you pierce the origami map and then you unfold it back. And what you get, you will get some holes. And these holes exactly correspond to the vertices of the circle pattern realization because okay, each two vertices are symmetric uh, with respect to the corresponding edge. So, uh, which also means that there is a two dimensional family of uh, circle pattern realizations for any team bedding, right? Because as a starting point, I can choose any point on the uh, origami map, pierce it, unfold it back, and I get a circle pattern realization. Okay. Uh, so, um, and then as soon as we know the definition of the origami map, there is a uniqueness theorem, at least in the setup of. Uh, biperiodic setup, uh, biperiodic graphs. For biperiodic graphs, uh, there is a unique team bedding with a bounded origami map. 
which is good because if we want to deal with some conformal structure, which is given by our embedding, there should be some, some uniqueness, at least in the biperiodic case, here it is. For the bounded origami map, there exists a unique, um, unique T embedding. Uh, okay, so now let us finally talk about the scaling limit results and how those embeddings are related to the conformal structure. So uh, first of all, we need the definition of the scaling limit itself, because if you deal with a regular lattice, then it is clear. In our setup, it's not clear. So let us give a definition of the mesh size. So uh, um, we, we, we ask our embedding to satisfy a literate condition, uh, which means that the, for any two points, which are, um, at a distance more than delta, we ask the origami to be a Lipschitz with a constant less than one. So here is the condition for the origami map in terms of the team bedding. And about this delta, we think as a mesh size. And uh, note that uh, due to this definition, all faces actually have diameter less than delta. However, they might be much smaller than delta. And this is not a problem for us. This is totally fine. Um, then uh, there is another assumption. Uh, let me skip it, I don't have time, but this is a technical assumption, uh, which we hope to get rid of, but we cannot do it so far. Um, roughly speaking, it is something about that if you have a random walk on team embeddings, then this is a well-defined random walk. So it's not going to one direction all the time. So it's well uh, behave as a random walk. I don't have time to explain it more. So then what we did is we introduced a nice definition of discrete holomorphic functions, uh, which we call t-holomorphicity on those embeddings. Uh, the definition um, is the following. So first of all, we ask our function to be indeed in the kernel of the Kestlin weights, which are defined by our embedding. So dt, this is just, you know, this geometrical Kestlin weights, which we defined. And we ask that those functions uh, satisfy this discrete homomorphicity condition, uh, but this is not it. The second condition is that on black faces, uh, it has a prescribed uh, arguments where the arguments are given in terms of the embedding itself. So what are the arg arguments? Here is a definition that for every two addressing faces, the product of you know arguments defined in those faces is uh, uh, give the same direction as the uh, edge of the corresponding team bedding. And what we ask that, you know, those functions have this prescribed um, uh, arguments. Uh, for those who are familiar with um, s holomorphicity introduced by Stanislav Smirnov, it can be seen as a generalization of uh, that special type of discrete homomorphicity. And what we did under those technical assumptions we proved, uh, we, we showed a priori regularity for such a discrete holomorphic functions. And uh, recall that uh, our inverse Kestlin matrix, which we're actually interested in, because this is, gives us all local statistics of the Daimler model, uh, it is indeed a T holomorphic function uh, by our definition. So it satisfies these two conditions. So it is a discrete holomorphic function. Uh, now, here is uh, one of the main results. Um, so uh, first of all, uh, under these technical assumptions, one of which is just the definition of the, of the mesh size, um, uh, we also need uh, the following three assumptions. So first of all, uh, assume that the origami map converges to zero. Uh, second, let us ask that the inverse Kestlin matrix is uniformly bounded as the mesh size goes to zero and that the uh, correlation functions on the boundary are uniformly small near the boundary. Then under these three assumptions, we can prove that uh, the fluctuations converge to the Gaussian prefield. Um, so uh, note that first of all, non-trivial condition here is that the origami converges to zero. Let me, let me, let me give you few remarks on it a little bit later. Let me discuss these two conditions. So this condition is, 
is natural in terms of the discrete complex analysis. Because if it's not bounded, that one should not expect that team embeddings describe a nice behavior of such a functions. So uh, the, the, the last condition is natural in terms of the uh, fluctuations of the height function because they should be zero on the boundary since the height function doesn't depend on the boundary of the uh, Daimler configuration. So the fluctuations are always simply zero there on the discrete level. And this is what we want to expect in the limit as well. It is just natural in terms of the uh, Daimler model itself. Um, however, these two assumptions are not to be a part of the assumptions in the theorem if we deal with the so-called perfect team bedding. So let me give you a definition of the perfect team bedding. Uh, recall that I didn't have any boundary conditions for the uh, for these outer outer boundary where we map to. Right when I was talking about uh, at least embeddings of the finite case with outer face of degree four, I can choose any polygon and embed it into it. So uh, we have some uh, freedom on choosing some, to adding some boundary conditions here as well. And this is what we do. So uh, a perfect team bedding is a team bedding where the boundary satisfies the following condition. First of all, the outer boundary is a tangential polygon, not exactly convex, but tangential. So uh, what does it mean? Uh, means that like if we consider the extension of corresponding edges, then they are tangented to the circle. Uh, and uh, the second condition is that, uh, recall that when we, uh, okay, it's too far. When we deal with augmented dual, then each vertex of the augmented dual on the boundary has degree three. And the second condition is that the inner corresponding third, uh, uh, edges lie on a bisectors on the corresponding angles. So this is our two additional conditions, which we add to the definition of team embedding. And this is what we call a perfect team embedding. And side condition is still the same that around each vertex, the sum of black and white angles are the same. And uh, what we claim is that uh, now, if you have a perfect team embeddings, the sequence of a perfect team embedding, that these two conditions are not needed anymore because they happen to uh, uh, be satisfied just by the construction. So if you have perfect embedding that, that two things are already uh, true. And here is a more general uh, theorem. So assume that uh, we deal with the perfect team embeddings, which still satisfies uh, those uh, assumptions, technical assumptions. And the second condition, instead of uh, assuming that the origami map converge to zero, uh, here we assume that the pair of T embedding and the origami map considered as the embedding in R2 plus two converge to a Lorentz minimal surface. And then in this setup, the fluctuations of the height function converge to the Gaussian prefield in the conformal structure of this Lorentz minimal surface. Um, okay, so uh, let me say, depending how much time do I have, do I have a couple of minutes? One, two, three. Okay, great. Uh, uh, all right, so uh, let me say a few words about the difference of these two cases when the origami converge to zero and then the origami converge to the Lorentz minimal surface. Um, so, uh, in, in, in the previous setup, what we have is that the corresponding discrete holomorphic functions when origami goes to zero in the limit are indeed discrete holomorphic. In general, this is not the case. Actually, what do we know? We know that the corresponding form is a closed form. And this happened to be in the limit as well. So the corresponding limited scaling limit of those functions uh, is indeed a closed form where what is Z and eta, this is just, okay, our embedding considered as a surface in R 
2 plus 2 converge to some surface in R2 plus 2. And uh, so what we know is that, OK, if this function disappears in the limit, so if the origami is 0, then what we get is that that just this form is closed, which is exactly means that the function f is discrete holomorphic itself. However, if the uh, this surface as a surface in R2 plus 2 converts to a minimal surface, to a Lorentz minimal surface, uh, then what we get is that this form is closed form. So the function f itself is not holomorphic anymore as it is. However, here, if we have our Lorentz minimal surface, right, then we have some parameterization, some conformal parameterization on the surface. And uh, since this form is a closed form, we can rewrite it in terms of uh, some new functions, uh, psi and phi. And what we know is that in the setup of Lorentz minimal surface, this function psi will be a discrete holomorphic, uh, not discrete, just a holomorphic function in the conformal structure of this uh, Lorentz minimal surface. So um, instead of discrete holomorphicity, actually in general, one should think that what we have is that we have some closed form where this is a closed form. But when the origami converges to zero, it happened to be a real discrete homomorphicity. Uh, in, in other case, like one should switch to this function psi, which actually can be defined even on a discrete level itself. I'm not going to do it, but just a comment. Um, okay, so this is, this is a comment which I wanted to do here. And uh, to finish, let me just mention some open questions. Uh, first of all, we still don't know how to prove uh, in general setup the existence of perfect team weddings. It is a big open question. Um, existence together with uniqueness. Uh, however, we have a conjecture that for any uh, bipyroidic, oh, uh, sorry, not bipyroidic, for any bipartite graph with any weights, uh, real valued weights, such embedding should exist. And it is even uh, unique up to some transformations, which I didn't talk about, but it is unique up to some reasonable uh, uh, symmetries uh, of uh, hyperboloid. And uh, the another uh, open question is that, uh, okay, I mentioned that those discrete embeddings as an embeddings to R2 plus two converge to a Lorentz minimal surface. Is there a way to find the proper notion of discrete Lorentz minimal surface? Do we do we actually can say that you know our embeddings is a nice discrete version of Lorentz minimal surface in some reasonable way? So this is another direction of of open questions here, and that's it. What I wanted to tell. Thank you very much. All right. Let's uh, let's thank Mariana for a great talk. Are there any questions? Can I ask maybe a question? Um, how how do, how does this your your uh, GFF convergence result relate to the original Kenyon uh, Okunkov conjecture? Because they have GFF in in a, in a conformal structure, which you explained was you know given by some equations, and then you have a what appears to be a, a different conformal structure. Are these the same? Uh, yeah, I mean, they, they, they should be the same because otherwise one of us made the wrong conjecture. Yes, um, but is that uh, But no, no yes, I mean, like what, uh, recall that what we have uh, deals in more general setup than Kenyon and Kinkov because Kenyon and Kinkov for bi-periodic graphs with bi-periodic weights. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we assume that in Kenyon and Kinkov setup, one will always see a minimal surface, some minimal surface, for um, origami maps, and uh, this is this is the case how how one related to another. Let me mention that there is a result by Chilkak and Dramasamy about the Aztec diamond, where it is known already for a while that uh, fluctuations inside a, a liquid region converge to the Gaussian prefield, and 
Kenyan Kunikov conjecture is checked in that setup. So uh, in this paper, what they did is they, they checked that, you know, our construction is uh, well uh, correspond to the Kenyan Kunikov setup. So they, they just check that what we get by um, these uh, embeddings, uh, you will obtain the same conformal structure. However, it's not an easy question to check that it is indeed the same one. So we, we did check it in, in a couple of uh, concrete uh, setups, not only this one, though other examples are not written yet. Uh, but yes, it is, it is a non-trivial question how to see that, you know, these minimal surfaces, these conformal structures on minimal surfaces uh, will appear in uh, Kenyon and Kuinkov uh, conjecture. But it should be the same, and at least in, in, in some concrete examples, we check that it is the case. So, so to rephrase, in some sense, you have proved your own version of the Kenyon and Kuinkov conjecture. In the sense, you've proved that it, it converges, converges to the Gaussian free field in, in a specific conformal structure, which you give. And then, then it's what it's missing, and it's true proved in some cases, is that is the same as, as the one that, that Kenyon and Kuinkov have then. Uh, yeah, like we check that in some cases it is the same. And in but, general, you expect uh, it to be always, but, it, but it's not known yet. Yeah, absolutely. I see. I see. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? So why is the biperiodic case more straightforward than? Uh, okay, so uh, first of all, for the non-biperiodic graphs, there is no nice definition of the height function. You can define the height function modulo two but it will not, yeah, I mean, there is no good definition of the height function. This is the main thing. If you have just a finite number of points of, on your graph where you don't have biperiodicity, then it's still okay. You will have a height function with, you know, some singularities around these, these vertices. But if you just start with, let's say, triangle lattice where you don't have, you know, you have an infinite, <laughs> number of problems, then the height function is not defined. It is defined, but only modulo two. So um, yeah, that's that's the main reason. And planarity here we need for many reasons, starting from complex analysis and again, like going back to, to be able to define nice function as well. Can I ask another question? Sorry, don't want to. Sure. Uh, I, I'm, I'm wondering how, how hard, so the, this assumption you make that uh, the TO converges to a, a Lorentz minimal surface, um, how, how hard an assumption is it in, in the following sense? Do, do you expect this to be something that you, you might be able to prove in some generality, except you haven't gotten around to doing it, or you think that this, this actually assumptions sort of cuts out some, some T embeddings and you know, leaves out some, some others? So it to be a real assumption or some or just something that you haven't yet proved but you know are expecting to be able to prove in some in some near future okay right so yes it is a non-trivial assumption it's even non non easy to check it uh imagine that you know some sequence of t and all like check that it is indeed a Lorentz minimal surface it's not a trivial uh, question however at least in kenyan and Kunkov setup we uh, conjecture that it is always the, the case so in Kenyon and Kuinkov setup, so if you deal with regular graphs, then you will always get a minimal surface. I see, I see. So it's a question of finding a proof, but you expect it to be true. Yeah. Okay, okay. All right, thank you. Any other questions? All right, if not, let's thank Mariana again.